We're here at the Starmus Global Science Festival in Yerevan's Hamalir, where many renowned scientists, Nobel laureates, musicians, artists, and former astronauts have converged. It's my pleasure to welcome SpaceX senior advisor and former NASA astronaut and engineer, Dr. Garrett Rissman. So Dr. Rissman, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Yeah, it's great to be here. So you've been on the Space Shuttle Endeavour Discovery Atlantis. You have performed spacewalks. So uh, you make all our resumes look rather bleak. <laughs> actually, that's not the case. Uh, yeah, I'm actually feeling like not very worthy here because I'm, I'm like the only participant that does not have a Nobel Prize. Oh, I see. Okay. So I'm thinking about trying to write something. Maybe I can get it in literature, <laughs> you know. Uh, maybe uh, get the peace throughout the entire region. And maybe, I, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I feel... I'm a little behind, actually. Right. Well, the dais was really quite incredible. I'm wondering <laughs> what you thought about uh, the Starmus Festival, how you got involved with it, and why do you think something like Starmus is important? So, boy, I, this, is, this is my first time in Armenia, but it's my third Starmus. So I went to two others. And originally I was involved because I became friends with uh, Oksana Leonova, the, the um, daughter of, of uh, Alexei Leonov. And she uh, and he were very involved with Starmos, and they introduced me to it, and I got invited to be a speaker, and I've been now making my third appearance. And it's, it's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed all three of them. Uh, this is the biggest, uh, the most grand and extravagant uh, so far, so that's really interesting. Uh, but all of them have, you know, are common in the sense that it's this really unique combination of music and artistry with science, and making that connection between the way the left and the right uh, parts of our mind work, but the importance of, of, of actually energizing both sides, uh, and, and that leads to the greatest discoveries both in art and in science. And, and it's really neat to see the evidence of that here. And, you know, I'm wondering what inspired you in your younger days? Um, I ask this because the Apollo missions, um, they really inspired a lot of young people. And um, some people feel that that interest in science has perhaps dulled a bit. In Armenia, for example, a lot of the Soviet murals that have been left behind depict cosmonauts, spaceships, um, and now many of them are in a dilapidated state. Do you think that there has been a dull in interest with regards to the sciences? Um, and how do you think that can be reinvigorated? I think there might have been a little bit of a lull, but what I'm seeing now that gives me a lot of hope and excitement is a resurgence of that same level of interest uh, that really harkens back to the days of Apollo. So yes, I was initially motivated the same way you just described by watching the Apollo missions uh, on old Super 8 movies. You know, I'm, 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 I'm old now, so the technology was a bit different, but I remember watching those films and being so inspired by seeing Neil and Buzz walking around on the moon and how they had a rendezvous in lunar orbit and dock, and I was just fascinated by the, the whole process. I never thought it would happen to me. I never thought I would have a chance to go to space, uh, but it, it ended up uh, working out, and, and, uh, and, and that's fantastic. And, and I think a lot of people were inspired by Apollo, but today I think a lot of people are being inspired again, not only by what NASA is doing and what the European Space Agency is doing and what uh, Roscosmos is doing and around the world and China is actually making great strides as well, but especially what's happening now in the private sector. So you see what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX, what Jeff Bezos is doing with Blue Origin. The rate of technological change and advancement now is as high as it was during Apollo. And, and, and that's the first time in my lifetime that it's really literally taking off again. And I see, you know, when I walk around with my SpaceX t-shirt on, uh, even here in Armenia, people say, ah, SpaceX, and they get excited. And I, I think that excitement maybe was slumbering for a little bit, but is now fully awake again. Yeah, because there's a lot of exciting things going on in the sphere of science at the moment. The James Webb Telescope is taking images of deep space. We also saw the first images of a black hole. I'm wondering, in particular, is there anything that you are particularly excited about? Well, the James Webb was uh, such an amazing ac accomplishment. And, and it was terrifying, though, because there's so many things that could have gone wrong and everything had to go right. And so the drama of watching that thing literally unfurl uh, was exhilarating from an engineer's perspective. Uh, from a scientist's perspective, seeing the result now, the images that are coming back are, su are super exciting. But for me, my particular area is human spaceflight. Uh, and what's happening right now with the, the uh, emergence of the SpaceX Dragon and Falcon 9, the Boeing Starliner, Orion on top of the, um, uh, on top of the SLS rocket, that's the Artemis mission, to go back to the moon for the first time, the last time 
that humans traveled beyond low Earth orbit, which is very, very close to the Earth. When, when I was on the space shuttle and on the space station, we we're only about 200 miles up, you know, almost maybe 300 kilometers, okay? So very close to the Earth. The moon is a quarter of a million miles away. We haven't been anywhere further than low Earth orbit. We've stayed within those couple hundred miles. Since the last time anybody went further than that, I was four years old at, is the last time. And we're finally gonna go and go back there and then beyond and even maybe to Mars. And that's all happening now at a very rapid pace. And, and that's why it's a, it's a wonderful time now to be watching what's happening in human spaceflight. I mean, I don't know if you heard this news, but Armenia launched its first state-owned satellite into space and it was latched to a SpaceX rocket that went off from Florida. Uh, there is an attitude, though, in Armenia that the country is small, it has many problems, few resources, it shouldn't be putting all this effort in science, research and development. But I've heard even Americans say, like, let's fix our country first before we go into space. What do you think about that attitude that um, science, research, development should not be prioritized? Or do you think it really should be? It always has an importance. Well, it, it's, it's a question of, of achieving the right balance. And if we were spending half of our GDP, if, if in an Armenia you took half of your GDP and spent it on, on research and ignored the problems of infrastructure and, and, and people that are struggling with uh, poverty and, and uh, all the other social issues that you have to deal with, whether it's Armenia or in the United States, that would be wrong, okay? But we're spending, in the United States, we're spending uh, less than 1% of our federal budget on NASA. So NASA's budget is less, is about a half of a penny of every tax dollar. Is get, it gets spent on everything that NASA does. That's the James Webb Space Telescope. That's the SLS rocket. That's the Orion capsule. That's the SpaceX Dragon. That's the Boeing Starliner. That's the, Curie, that's the Perseverance rover, Ingenuity flying around on Mars. Less than one half of one penny Per dollar, so less than one half of one percent. And as far as Armenia, that that satellite that was launched, I don't know the numbers, but I'm guessing it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the the product of, of Armenia. So, so yes, I think that level of expenditure, when you look at it as an investment uh, in Armenia, in the future of Armenia, maybe it inspires some uh, people here to study science and math. Maybe they do something in space. Maybe they do something in in medicine. Maybe they do something uh, in technology. That is, you're making an investment, and, and it will, will is, it's, is, it, is it worth a tiny percent? Of, I think it, of course it is. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Starmus has put a focus on the link between artistry and science. I'm wondering what you think about this connection, which isn't immediately apparent to many people. Are the two closer in essence than one might presume? And how have you seen the two converge? What did you think about this attitude to put this as a focus? You know, it, it is interesting, and, and I do think it is important. I, I could take it from, a, uh, from an engineer or scientist viewpoint. I, I do play guitar, but I'm terrible. Brian May is much better. <laughs> if you want to hear somebody play guitar, you don't want to hear me play guitar. I only play guitar when I want people to leave my house. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not much of a musician, but I can tell you that, that creativity is important for engineering and science because First, before you can prove something mathematically and discover something, you have to be able to imagine it, okay? Before we could, at SpaceX, before we can make a rocket that could co launch and then come back, come through the atmosphere and land on its tail, on a, on a, on a back on a landing pad, before we could do that, somebody had to imagine how that could work. And that's a very creative process. And I see it happen as we design the cockpit, as we design this new vehicle, the Crew Dragon, to take people back into space from America. We first had to imagine what did, what did the suits look like? What did, the, what did the displays look like? And without that creative element, we couldn't accomplish what we did. So it is, it is a, a great science, great engineering is in essence a creative process, just like writing music. And at the same time, what I hear from people who do uh, are musicians, is that if you understand the science, the mathematics behind the music, because at the end of the day, there's actually, there's a lot of, you know, the creation of sound, sound is vibration, it's, 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 it's different wavelengths and different multiples of different frequencies, it's, it's mathematics. So there's definitely a relationship. Mm -hmm. And finally, very briefly, this is your first time in Armenia. 
what was your impressions of the country? How did you find it? How did you find Armenia? Yeah, so I've only been here for two days, so uh, okay. it's, it's a little early to render a verdict. But I, I so and I came here with a friend of mine named uh, Sarkis Filingarian. Uh, he, I, I, I've known him since I was a graduate student at Caltech in Pasadena. And he, uh, he always talked about how wonderful this country is, how beautiful it is, how great the food is, and how wonderful the people are. And then when I heard that Starmus was coming here and I was invited, I invited him to come along and I said, this is your chance to prove it, that you are right. <laughs> and so far, I think he's right. Okay, well, Dr. Rissman, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.